Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, or should we say the Chronicles of Bigfoot. And you are so welcome to join me this evening because we've got a lovely story for you tonight. But before we get started, you know the rules. Go and get yourself something effervescent and sparkling to drink, or something warm and comforting. And if I've never heard about your drink, I'd love to know all about it. Because everybody out there is drinking something different and rather unusual. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Carol Williamson could not help herself. She was naturally nosy by nature, an unfortunate vice that always rather annoyed her husband, who felt it was not appropriate to snoop into other people's business. But Carol could not help herself from prying. She was interested in people, but her natural shyness meant that her curiosity was somewhat bridled. If she was in a stranger's house and found herself in a family cloakroom, she would clandestinely open up the cabinets and have a good old snoop, rifling through the medicine bottles and strange medications, curiously reading the labels. If she gained anything from rifling around in other people's medicine cabinets, it was that she was able to comprehend some of the scientific names or jargon for various medications used for heartburn, diarrhoea, acid reflux and anxiety. An invaluable wealth of knowledge, she told herself. She also tended to engage in the strange, rather bizarre behaviour when shopping at Walmart or Costco. She enjoyed looking at what people were buying in their shopping carts. It was amazing what she would gleam about people from their shopping. And the added plus was she found herself experimenting with brand new brands of products for her own family, from shampoos to interesting varieties of delicatessen meats. Carol could see the dark blue removal van parked outside the old Victorian house opposite their home, in their illustrious green leafy Toronto neighbourhood, known for its large congregations of renovated Victorian homes from the 1860s to 90s, many that had been superbly restored to their former glory over the years, so that the dignified opulent houses in Cabbage Town made you feel as if you were stepping back in time to the 1800s, they showily boasted gothic influences, intricately designed woodwork, pitched roofs, wraparound porches, turrets, roof towers, and lavishly ornate gingerbread trim. You could almost envisage the cobbled stone streets of bygone days, the oil-fired street lamps, the horse-drawn carriages, the people bustling up and down the streets, the smell of roasted chestnuts permeating the air, the muffin man standing on the street corner, with his large basket of pastries crying out, Fresh pastries for sale, two for the price of one. Very good deal. Carol enjoyed living in Cabbage Town, as all the individualistic Victorian houses were steeped in such a rich, vibrant history. Even if you were someone who did not approve of Victorian architecture, you would definitely feel something quite profound walking down these tree-lined neighbourhoods and glancing at the historic homes. Carol wasn't sure what the feeling actually was, but she perceived that the houses seemed to have soaked up their rich, illustrious history, like the prunes in a bowl of tea. And they wore that history proudly, with a lofty, regal deportment, as if the houses themselves knew exactly how good they looked. It was a beautiful spring morning, with no sign of a cloud in sight. It was fresh, the sky a cup of cornflower blue. The soft, buoyant sunlight streamed through the tall, lofty trees that serenaded both sides of the street, with boughs richly covered in a sumptuous tapestry of green, leafy foliage. These ancient, stoic trees, the silent witnesses of past generations, come and gone. Most of the distinguished Victorian houses in the street were fringed with small front yards, neatly trimmed hedges, little white picket fences, Pretty courtyards, beds filled with hollyhocks and chrysanthemums. The pretty street was dappled in the soft shadows of early morning, the plants covered liberally in moist fragrant dew, and the only sounds that injected the silence on this quiet, tranquil street were the pretty trills of the birdsong. Yet there was a bustle of movement this morning at the old Victorian house directly opposite Carol's home, which was buzzing with activity. 
The elderly couple, Mr. and Mrs. Morrison, whom had lived in that house only a month prior, had retired to Florida, and now the red brick Victorian, with its grey slate roof and gingerbread trim, had been purchased by new people. Carol hoped to God that the new owners would be from her generation, with children of similar age to her own, between the ages of ten and twelve, who could potentially become good friends with her two boys, Stephen and Rory. Was that too much to hope for, she wondered. You could dream, couldn't you? It would be so great for her kids to have friends to play with, living on the opposite side of the street. Carol lifted the binoculars perched presumptuously on the oakwood coffee table, opposite a large collection of leather-bound books. Carol's hands began to tremble when she saw a black Mercedes draw up outside the house opposite. For a brief moment, her heart almost plummeted, like a stone being flung to the bottom of a large body of water. She thought the owner of the black Mercedes would likely be an older gentleman, but to her amazement, after the car was parked, rather haphazardly on the pavement, a young woman got out of the driver's side door, followed by two young boys of a similar age to her own two children, who looked to be staring up at the old Victorian they were moving into, as if seeing it for the very first time. Maybe they'd never seen it before, Carol thought, and had promptly been informed that this was their new home. She wondered how she would feel if she was now wearing their shoes moving into a house that wore its history like a resplendent overcoat. She saw the woman more closely through the binoculars. She was pretty in a girl-next-door kind of way, wearing a smart-looking pair of white cotton slacks and a blue and white striped blouse. She began to talk earnestly to the beefy-looking man from the removal van, who had biceps so large Carol was certain he was one of those men that ate over a dozen eggs at breakfast every morning, and possibly after a gruelling, exhausting day spent hauling and heaving heavy furniture around other people's properties. He could be found in the gym spending the remainder of his day lifting heavy-duty weights, pumping iron so hard to quadruple his size. The kind of man you could not drag away from the heavy-duty weights of the gym, even if you tried. She wondered whether when he was young, he'd been bullied for being so slight. He was certainly making up for lost time now, possibly hoping that one day he'd bump into one of those kids that had dared to bully him at school. And now they would never snigger at a man of his impressive girth and size. The woman's arms were outstretched. She was pointing directly towards the Victorian house, talking earnestly to Mr. Beefcake. She was probably telling him where all her furniture was to go, Carol thought. The two young boys had wandered over to the oak tree. They appeared to be talking among themselves excitedly. Carol could understand what they were talking about without even listening to their conversation. Let's just say the towering oak trees on the street with their huge sculptural boughs were begging to be climbed. One of the boys attempted to climb the tree, but moments later their mother was demanding the kids to stop dawdling and help her unload some of the boxes from the back of the black Mercedes, which they did. Their faces dappled with disappointment. Soon Carol was watching some ornate pieces of rosewood, oak and mahogany furniture, expensive antiques, rolled up Persian carpets, rococo mirrors covered in intricate carvings of flowers and leaves. Large paintings sellotaped together with bubble wrap, along with boxes of stuff labelled kitchen, bedroom, lounge, scullery. They were all being brought into the house from the blue van by Mr. Beefcake, along with his spindly-looking companion, who was tall and lean, but surprisingly strong for one of such a slight build. Could they be brothers, Carol wondered? They certainly looked remarkably alike. She could understand why the young woman and her husband had bought the house opposite. It was one of the best-looking, most envied Victorian houses on the street that had fetched a tidy sum and probably cost a small fortune to boot. It had been snapped up immediately on its very first opening day. Houses like that never stayed on the market for very long. "'What are you looking at?' asked Carol's husband, coming into the wood-panelled living room, with its long, sweeping, velvety curtains that caressed the top of the gleaming oakwood floors and resplendently framed the bay-box windows overlooking the house opposite. He didn't need to ask what she was doing. 
as her husband was fully aware of Carol's propensity to spy on the goings-on in the street. But he could never resist having a dig at her for being so nosy. So who are you spying on now, my sweet lovely? He teased, giving her a friendly little peck on the cheek. Anything I should know about? Carol became defensive. Don't be silly. Of course I'm not spying on anyone. She lied, her pale skin growing a shade of crimson. As her cheeks heated, what do you take me for? I'm just watching the new people move in, that's all. It's a free world. I'm entitled to do what I want. I notice there's a couple in their thirties, I think, moving into the old Victorian opposite. And they have kids of similar ages to ours. Isn't that great news? Her husband shrugged his shoulders. That depends if we get to know them at all. A lot of people around here keep themselves to themselves. That's what folk are like these days. Private, reserved, very contained. It's not like it used to be in the good old days, when there was a thriving community spirit. People knew their neighbours on first-name terms. I don't know half the people that live on our street, so it's highly doubtful we'll get to know the neighbours opposite us. Unless, of course, by nature they're naturally gregarious and outgoing, and their kids happen to attend the same schools as ours. Well, we'll get to know them if we make an effort, said Carol firmly. Her husband looked at Carol doubtfully. You're extending the hand of friendship to strangers, are you? That'll be a first time ever, he chuckled. You're not exactly the assertive type, and you can be painfully shy towards strangers. So why change the habits of a lifetime? I'm tired of not knowing people on this street, that's why, said Carol. If it means overcoming my timorous leanings, then I'm going to do it. Sometimes you have to rise above your fears. That's what surfers do all the time, don't they, when they ride those waves? I bet sometimes they're desperately afraid, but they do it anyway. It's called feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Good for you, sweetheart, said her husband, sounding impressed. I, for one, will be the first to applaud you for trying to overcome your shyness. Go over then, visit the woman, bring her a cake or something. You know, that's a great idea, said Carol. I might just do that. Thanks, she said, blowing her husband an affectionate kiss before he left the house. Bye, Mum, the kids called out to her, following their dad out of doors, with their knapsacks flung over their shoulders. She watched as all three members of her beloved family climbed hurriedly into her husband's white Hyundai. He'd be dropping them off at school and then driving to work himself. They'd only be back in the early evening, as the school was over the road from her mother's house. The children would spend the rest of the afternoon with her, doing their homework, until her husband returned home that evening after picking them up. So Carol was left alone in the house with her two cats curled up comfortably on the sofa sound asleep, and her binoculars at the ready to keep her busily preoccupied on the house opposite. It was later that afternoon, after Carol had industriously baked a pecan nut pie, that she slipped on some cotton slacks and a casual sweater. She tied her brown shoulder-length hair away from her pretty heart-shaped face into a neat ponytail and put on a touch of lipstick, and under her breath she told herself firmly, "'You can do this, Carol.' Conquer your reticence. Be bold. Be brave. Remember, you're just dropping off a pie to the neighbours. It's no big deal, so don't make it one. The woman over the road is only human. She's not going to bite your head off for dropping over a pie. It had been a problem with Carol, being painfully shy, reserved and diffident with strangers. It had irked her throughout her life. People had so often mistook her shyness for rudeness. She had so often clandestinely slipped away at social gatherings to avoid those awkward conversations with people. It was a laborious struggle for the self-effacing Carol to conquer her fear of talking to strangers. Sometimes when she did her level best to communicate, the words never came out right, and when they did, she'd often say something really stupid that had done her no favours in acquiring any friendships over the years. Gregarious people with bubbly personalities didn't want to hang around timid church mice who were too afraid of their own shadow. So armed with the pie in her hand, she crossed the road with legs crumbling beneath her, with the awkwardness of her insecurity that hung around her like a choker chain of pearls on her neck. 
Her heart flapped violently in her chest, as Carol felt like a finch caught within the jaws of a big house cat. It was a blissful, lackadaisical, lazy afternoon, when all was quiet on the street, and even the tall, lofty trees with their sculptural boughs, swathed in verdant foliage, seemed rather aloof, detached, almost indifferent. They gradually became more ambiguous in the fading light of the late afternoon. The temperatures had dropped significantly, and there was a distinctive biting chill in the air, but Carol barely noticed the cool breeze nudging against her skin. The gunmetal grey sky was deepening, becoming inkier with every passing minute. Carol's family had not returned home yet, so now was the time to strike while the iron was hot. But a tiny, insecure, frightened voice in the back of her mind was whispering to her, Don't do it! Don't do it, Carol! You'll embarrass yourself! You'll humiliate yourself! Don't do it! Carol refused to listen to the gnawing voice that had robbed her confidence over the years. Without remorse, like a furtive burglar stealing the family's most prized jewels. Carol had never welcomed a new family to the neighbourhood before, even though she'd lived in Cabbage Town for over seven years. For many, the unassuming young woman came across as unfriendly, as her withering confidence made her seem like a cold fish, with the emotional warmth of a dead cod. Let's just say, for one as inquisitive as Carol, reaching out to a perfect stranger like this, with a pecan nut pie in her hands, was well out of the bounds of her comfort zone, but she was going to do it anyway. It was like a powerful undercurrent of some kind was dominating the insecure side of herself, and the forceful gravitational pull was encouraging her to make friends with this woman that had moved into the house opposite hers, for no apparent rhyme or reason. As Carol approached the house, she observed a large white and tortoiseshell pussycat staring at her through its glowing yellow eyes, perched on the box bay window, looking remarkably comfortable in its new abode. It gave Carol a scathing, rather condescending look, as if to say, We don't need riffraff like yourself coming to our door. Now please go away. Carol ignored the cat. She was going to do this. She banged on the door at first with a quiet, rather reluctant tap, and then with a more assertive knock. The young woman she'd seen earlier in the day, through her binoculars, opened the door to her. It swung wide open with a loud creak. The door was begging to be oiled. It groaned and protested as it finally opened. Carol found herself staring at the young woman. She'd been watching all morning. She had a pretty scattering of freckles on her nose, a golden skin, and green eyes framed by thick dark lashes. Carol became immediately tongue-tied as if she'd suddenly come under an attack of nerves and had lost her voice. She managed a reticent squeak that sounded nothing like her real voice. Uh, this is for you, she said, flushing. I it's pecanut pie. I, I hope you're not allergic to nuts. I, I, I just wanted to welcome you to the neighbourhood. I, I noticed the removal van opposite this morning. I, I saw you with your kids. Uh, that's so kind of you, said the woman. So incredibly kind. What a thoughtful thing of you to do. I've been running around like a headless chicken all day. There's so much to do at the moment. Everything all over the place, you know. My name is Sheila, and you are, she asked, extending her hand out to Carol, who shook it shyly, her heart flapping wildly in her chest. The woman had a firm handshake, was not introvert, repressed, or even reserved. You could tell that by her reassured demeanour. I'm Carol, she said, shrinking self-consciously in the doorway. I live at the house directly opposite yours. As I was saying, I couldn't help noticing the blue delivery van parked outside this morning. All the boxes being brought into your house. I know what moving's like. It's an exhausting business. Tell me about it, said Sheila, rolling her eyes in exasperation. They say moving is as bad as getting a divorce, and I think I agree on that. Good to meet you, Carol. Would you like to come in for a brief moment? I must just apologise for the pandemonium, the chaos and boxes all over the place. It's going to be a nightmare to get everything unpacked and to sift my way through all of this. I think Pegasus is the only one settled in our house. The moment he arrived, he settled in at once into the window to watch the comings and goings on the street. Oh, you mean your cat? Yes, I saw him in the bay window, giving me a haughty look. Oh, that's Pegasus for you.
giggled Sheila. He thinks he's cut out of royal cloth, he does. He has a very high and mighty attitude, looks down on everyone he meets. I think in a previous life he had to have belonged to the King of England, and he still thinks he's from regal stock. I won't come in. It's very nice of you to ask, said Carol bashfully, but I can see you're busy. If you need anything, like a cup of sugar or something, I'm over the road. I was wondering if you'd like to come to dinner tomorrow night. Her husband would be impressed with her. Where did that come from? The words had tumbled out of her mouth before she had a chance to rein them in. Is everybody like you around here? asked Sheila. So friendly, I mean. You've made me feel so welcome. How desperately kind of you. I'd love to accept your kind invitation, but I've got two kids, so dinner would be difficult. I can't leave them unsupervised, but thanks for asking all the same. Bring them over, said Carol. They're most welcome to join us. My two boys would love to meet your f boys. I, I think they're of a similar age. I can give them pizza and Coca-Cola in the playroom, and we can eat in the main dining room. I was thinking of making my baked ham. Well, that would be lovely then. How can I possibly refuse an invitation like that? For the record, I love ham. We'd be delighted to join you. What time should we come? 6.30 would be great, said Carol, her legs trembling in her shoes. See you then. You invited the woman over the road who just moved in to dinner, asked her husband Clifton, raising a brow. You know nothing about them, and you've just invited them like that on a whim. You do surprise me, Carol. This is a turn-up for the books. What happened to the shrinking violet I know so well that a bore social interaction of any kind? You've never been this impulsive before. I must admit, I am very impressed. I don't know how it happened. I just blurted it out, and then she accepted. Anyway, admit it. The problem with people around here, and that includes you and me, is if we don't reach out to others and make an effort, we'll never make friends. Let's not kid. My self-conscious reserve has destroyed my ability to acquire any friends over the years. And if I don't change, neither will my life. The woman over the road is around about our age, and her children appear to be similar ages to our kids. It would be nonsensical not to make friends with them. I'm tired of not knowing half the people around here. People may be friendly, but they keep themselves to themselves. And I don't help myself by being so unapproachable, like a large brick wall. Well, sweetheart, if you conquer your fears like you did today, you'll certainly begin to make friends. You never give people the chance to get to know you. They think you're standoffish and rude, but you're anything but. I've got a great feeling we're going to like them, said Carol confidently. She seems desperately nice. Our type of people, I think they are. The dinner had gone better than anyone could have anticipated. There was a natural camaraderie and rapport among the adults. Lots of banter around the table. A plethora of laughter. The couple's kids were hitting it all favourably, with Carol's own children. They were playing Monopoly in the old Victorian playroom at the back of the house, eating pizza washed down with large glasses of Coca-Cola, and by the sounds of things, having a rip-roaring time. Occasionally the cheerful giggles and chuckles could be heard permeating the walls of the wood-panelled dining room, where the adults had congregated for dinner. Carol felt as if she'd known Sheila for an age, when they'd only just met, and Clifton was getting on favourably with her husband Niles, whom shared her husband's passion for wildlife photography. The conversation flowed as smoothly as the Cabernet Sauvignon they were drinking back. The refreshing alcohol, with its fragrant floral notes, seemed to actively encourage the breaking away of inhibitions and the loosening of tongues. Carol, normally restrained by her demure, lowly reticence, found there were moments she became quite animated, so much so she failed to gain control of her tongue and followed the age-old rule of avoiding discussing certain taboo contentious subjects like religion and politics. It was as if the shy woman had come out of her cocoon and transformed herself into a beautiful butterfly. The food Carol prepared this evening seemed to have been met with great appreciation. Thick slices of warm gammon ham, served with warm potatoes, asparagus and Greek salad. It was melt-in-the-mouth delicious, and the warm, succulent meat crumbled in the mouth. I have to say this is absolutely delicious, Carol, 
Sheila had praised her. Remind us to come over to you folk for dinner more often. Carol was pleasantly surprised to find that Sheila's two boys, Peter and Paul, were exactly the same age as hers, so it would seem that the couple had much in common. As is the case with couples who have children of a similar age, it seemed inevitable that the conversation began to veer towards their children. The schools, the sports, so much more besides. And Carol was talking more than she had ever done in her entire life. So do your children by any chance have any unusual passions? Sheila had asked Carol. I know my son is fixated by anything to do with pirates. He loves to dress up as Captain Jack Sparrow. Unusual passions, said Carol. Let's see. That would be Stephen, she said, chuckling. Stephen's completely crazy about that program, Finding Bigfoot. Oh my God, you should see him. He's so addicted to anything Bigfoot related. He gullibly swallows up the accounts as if they're the gospel truth. Of course, I tried to tell him that Bigfoot is not real, but he won't listen to my ramblings. He tells me I'm the naive one for doubting eyewitness accounts, for believing it's impossible for a creature like that to actually exist. That boy of mine, he's got a big imagination, she says, taking a large sip of her wine, letting out a giggle, followed by an inappropriate hiccup, which morphed into several more embarrassing hiccups. There was a long, uncomfortable silence around the table. It was so tangible you could feel it, almost as if you were playing a game of musical chairs. And when the music stopped, the whole table froze like a picture in a storybook, trapped in that moment in time, or a frozen black and white photograph. It was like everyone stopped eating. The cutlery in China stopped clinking. It would seem three pairs of eyes were pinned on Carol as if the words that had so easily rolled off her tongue had caused great offence, as if she had trespassed onto conversation that had high boundary walls and forts. Oh my God, she thought to herself, I've breached my etiquette as a hostess. I've struck a raw nerve here of impropriety with an inappropriate foie poi or gaffe. What have I said? Then it occurred to her that her guests possibly believed that Bigfoot was real and inadvertently she had poked fun at them by mocking her own son's fervent passion for the critter. This was a social blunder of note that had landed her in the hot syrup, like a fly swimming around in a honeypot that was almost impossible to fish out intact. What had she done? Sorry, did I say something to cause offence? asked Carol, looking around apologetically, at the faces staring back blankly at her. Some sensitive topic should not be discussed with strangers controversial subjects that could easily ruffle feathers, and maybe Bigfoot was one of them. It was Sheila that broke the awkward, clawing silence. She frowned. Why are you so sure Bigfoot is not real? She challenged. Look at America. Look at Canada. So much uncharted remote wilderness. So much untraversed, unexplored space. And you really think it's not possible for a creature like Bigfoot to exist? If you don't mind my saying, Carol... It strikes me that you're the naive one here, not your son, Stephen. You're undermining your son by ridiculing and deriding his faith in Bigfoot, and that's not a nice thing to do. Forgive me for being so blunt, but I could never belittle my own son like that. Carol flushed. I think it's unlikely that Bigfoot is real. I really do, but I'm willing to have an open mind about it. On reflection, you're right. I am demeaning and marginalising my son. You make a valid point there. I've never looked on it like that from that perspective. But I wouldn't like it if someone made fun of something I believed. So you're right. I have denigrated him unfairly. You're willing to have an open mind, are you? asked Sheila, scoffing. You're making fun of your twelve-year-old son, believing in Bigfoot, when you don't know the hell what you're talking about. I've met lots of cynics like you, believe me, over the years. They're so quick to doubt. They falsely assume they know everything. It makes me hopping mad. The smug presumptuousness of people. The haughty, pompous pride. The swaggering arrogance. The condescending reproach. The supercilious snobbishness. The insolent lordliness. Believe me, I've seen it all. It's so pretentious. It completely disgusts me. Think about it for a moment. Extinct species of animals are being discovered all the time. If you think Bigfoot doesn't exist, I feel desperately sorry for you. 
You're like a closed book, not willing to accept that you know so very little about almost everything. Carol looked stunned by Sheila's almost aggressive confrontation. But before she could respond, Sheila had burst into tears. They rolled down her cheeks unapologetically, and Carol wished with all her heart she'd never broached the subject of Bigfoot. Who knew it could reduce a grown woman to tears like this? Carol reached out to squeeze Sheila's arm reassuringly. Sheila flinched, pulling it away, while Carol's husband went to get her a box of tissues. Oh my God! Carol had set the cat among the pigeons. There was no going back from this. Carol would be lucky if this couple still wanted to remain friends with them. I'm sorry about my wife's imprudent tactlessness, said Carol's husband to Sheila. I promise you she didn't mean to upset you. It's just she sometimes recklessly says things before she thinks. My wife would never wish to offend a living soul. She's got a heart of gold, I promise you. My husband's right, said Carol. If there's an elephant in the room that should never be discussed, I will invariably be the one that brings it up. I've lost friendships over the years for heedlessly blurting out inappropriate things. You're right. What do I know about the subject of Bigfoot? Absolutely nothing. America's a huge place, like you say. And yes, Bigfoots could exist. I'm being incredibly arrogant, not opening my mind to such a possibility. You must excuse my wife as well, said Niles. Bigfoot is a very, very sensitive subject for Sheila. It brings up all kinds of repressed memories of her brother, you see. My wife was terribly close with her late brother. And Bigfoot, well, it was a subject dear to both of their hearts. A secret they shared together. It's not what you think, said Sheila, blowing her nose in a tissue. I better explain myself. Sheila took a couple of gulps of white wine until a rosy glow came rushing back into her ashen cheeks. Carol noticed she was trembling, but the wine seemed to anchor her to the chair and steady her nerves. Carol could see what she thought could potentially be a great friendship between them, going pear-shaped, like so many friendships before. What was wrong with her? It was like she had a poncho for improvidently broaching objectionable subjects that were likely to cause great upset like a festering scab being picked at over and over again. On this evening she had abandoned her shyness, only to cause great distress around this dinner table. The dinner had gone so smoothly up until this moment. Let's just say her mother had warned Carol that her impetuous unguarded tongue could get her into trouble, especially after a drink or two, when her shyness dissipated and a wobbly confidence had taken over. You better watch yourself, sweetheart her mother had told her once. You wonder why you lose friends, but listen to yourself. Sometimes you can be unintentionally discourteous without meaning to be. There was a stiff, unyielding, tight silence around the dinner table, as all eyes steadily focused on Sheila. She composed herself, so that her slouched back that had slunk into the upholstered chair in a relaxed posture became as straight and streamlined as a pencil. She adopted a guarded, circumspect posture, like a defensive wall. Her green eyes focused directly on Carol, as if for a brief moment, Carol was the only person in the room whom she was addressing. I'd like to say, Carol, that I know unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, that Bigfoot is real. So there you are. That is part one of our story. Part two is tomorrow night, so I look forward to you tuning in. Until next time, goodbye and good night.